For those of you who I don't know, my name is Jared Whitaker. I'm an extension agronomist over in Statesboro. I work with cotton. Um, those of you who aren't aware, we lost our counterpart in Tifton. So um, Guy Collins, he left and went home to North Carolina. So you guys are stuck with me for a little while until we get some, some help. But uh, I'm going to talk about cotton agronomic stuff. Um, Y'all got any questions, y'all be sure to let me know. We've got a small group. Um, I do want to carry, go through a few things from the standpoint of variety selection, PGRs, um, seeding rates, and then maybe a couple other things if we've got time. Um, I'll run through a lot of stuff, and you probably heard a lot of information today, and honestly, you're probably a little information overloaded, right? One place that you'll probably be able to find most of this information, most things that I'll talk about, and most of what we've gone through is at our website, um, ugacotton.com. Um, most of what I'll talk about, actually the slides I'll present today will be on there. You'll have an opportunity to revisit those things and, and kind of uh, keep up with us. We do make some, uh, you know, a new posts every now and again, um, and we'll do that on a continual basis, and it's a good place to look for information. So thinking about uh, cotton variety, thinking about cotton production, you know, once we think about planting cotton, what's our first decision that we're going to make as far as, um, you know, Cotton production, that first thing will be variety selection, right? It's going to be an expensive decision. It's an important decision. It can, you know, ultimately make a, make a play a role in what kind of yields we expect to see um, from a high end and then ultimately from a low end. There's a lot of good information on variety performance out there. Um, you know, we've got our OVT data that shows us a lot of information on a lot of new varieties. I see Anton in the back. Um, we appreciate what they do for us. Gives us an opportunity to look at how... Um, varieties perform over a large number of locations. What I'll share with you today is information from our um, county trial program, so to speak. And what that county trial program consists of is basically a program that uh, me and the other cotton agronomists started about four years ago where we tried to look at variety performance from a standpoint of being able to look at how varieties respond over a large number of locations. Um, what we tried to do is get basically a set of varieties that are available from seed companies, ones that you guys are going to be able to plant the next year, ones that have proven um, good performance in the past, and basically plant that set of varieties over a large number of locations. So what it does for us is one, and we, we actually do it in an on-farm situation, it gives us an opportunity to look at real world you know, data, you know, on the farm type situations, and then also gives us an opportunity to look at see how these varieties perform over a bunch of different environments. If you know Georgia weather, it can rain an inch on me and it's not raining at all on Calvin, right? You know, it's extremely variable. If you think about cotton variety performance, you know, we've got a lot of good varieties in Georgia. For me, the thing is, is, you know, how do you sort out some of those best varieties? So if you look at last year's program, um, we had 12 varieties in our program. Um, and if you see those varieties, they've got them listed here. We had three Delta Pine varieties, three Phytogen varieties, three from Bayer. Um, a cropland genetics, and two next-gen varieties from Americot. As far as the locations we got data from, you know, you got the counties highlighted here in blue. Um, and if you kind of look at cotton production in Georgia, other than our northeast and northwest, you know, little pockets of cotton, we pretty much, you know, kind of filled up the cotton belt as far as having trials in different locations. Um, what you'll be looking at is information from 20 of these trials last year. You know, we try to plant a bunch of them. We ultimately don't end up harvesting all of them. I think we planted 23 last year. We're able to get information from 20 of those. <laughs> so looking at data from last year, um, what you're looking at here is ultimately uh, average lint yield from those 12 varieties across those 20 locations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and you've got yields averaged across those locations and you've got the varieties sorted from highest average yielding variety to lowest average yielding variety. Couple things to point out looking at it from that standpoint. You know, if you think about which varieties are best, which ones did best, ultimately we'd rather have one, you know, one further towards the top, so ultimately better than one towards the bottom, right? But if you think about looking at the data, you're looking at average lint yield across those locations, a couple things to think about. One, there's only a pound difference yielding these two. And if you look at the whole spread, you know, the whole spread, the only difference in yield is about 140 pounds. So what does that mean for us as far as variety selection and thinking about varieties for next year? For one, I think it means we've got a lot of good varieties to choose from, right? Also, I think it shows that, you know, when you do that many trials, you're going to kind of have some washing of the data, right? So again, you know, we're looking at what I'd call the cream of the crop 
as far as varieties go. Um, and what you're looking at here on the right is kind of what I would consider to be indicators of consistency. You know, like I said, we've got a lot of good varieties. In my opinion, you could plant all 12 of these varieties and make over three bell cotton very easily. Where we seem to sort them out is looking at how consistently they perform. So just one way to think about it and one way we look at it is what you're looking at here are percentages and these percentages are basically uh, indicators of consistency. In this case, it's basically the percent of time a variety finished above the trial average. So if you look at it that way, there's three varieties here that were above the trial average at least 70% of the time. If you look at it that way, you can see that some were very consistent as far as being above average and some were very inconsistent as far as being uh, their performance. You've seen this in the past, talk about performance, looking at how often or what the frequency of them finishing in the top four, top three, top two, and how often they actually numerically won the trial, right? So just one way to look at it. Ultimately, I think doing it this way, we kind of get a better idea of how these things, you know, perform as far as consistency. And ultimately, if you think about trying to make a variety selection decision, consistency is probably a good way to think about it. Since we've kind of, if you think about weather in Georgia, I'm still waiting on an average weather year. You think about variety selection and variety performance, each year's different, right? We have done this program for some, some years now. Just looking back at 2013, you know, we had 12 varieties and we had 17 locations. And you can see here, um, we've got those varieties sorted from 1 to 12 as far as average yield. Um, and you can see which ones maybe are more consistent as far as their top performance. What I've done on this slide is taken the varieties that we had in the trials in 13 and 14 and, and tried to look at how they performed. Ultimately, we had nine varieties that were in the on-farm trials in 13 and 14. And what you're looking at here is those varieties sorted um, from one to nine as far as average lint yield. Again, if you look at the spread, it just so happens the top two are within one pound of each other, right? And then if you look at the spread, we're talking about a little more than 100 pounds. So again, these varieties have done well for us. And when you look at that many on farm trials, a lot of times there's a wash in the data if you look at just average length yield. This column here is kind of an indicator of consistency of performance. And what you're looking at here in this column is the percent of time a particular variety was in the top third or the top three of those nine. And here you're able to see that there's three varieties in this case that were above or at the top third at least 50% of the time. In my opinion, we're pretty consistent in their top performance, right? Another way to look at the data when you have this many trials is a lot of times you hear companies talk about where a variety fits. Some varieties are dry land varieties, some varieties are irrigated varieties, one's a racehorse, that kind of thing. One way we try to look at that it's basically when we have this many trials, we can look to see how these varieties perform in different yield environments. And what I mean by yield environments is what we did, and if you look at this column, we're basically looking at the 13 trials that we had average yields less than 1,000 pounds. So in my opinion, that'd be kind of our dry land environments, right? If you look at it that way, the top three overall aren't necessarily the top three as far as consistency in that situation. You know, we see that 499 is probably the most consistent variety when we had yields less than 1,000 pounds. And you can see how it works out when we look at higher yielding trials and even the top yielding trials. So just kind of wanted to show you that and talk about it from a standpoint, you know, if we make suggestions on varieties, that's kind of how we're doing it, kind of how we're thinking about it. I know a lot of us plant cotton and we think about variety selection. The first thing we say is we need a variety we can spray Liberty on, right? Whether it be in a variety that we can think about using uh, Liberty to control weeds, glyphosate resistant pigweed. What you're looking at here is the same trials from 14 on those 20 locations, but what I did is basically pulled out the six varieties that you could potentially spray Liberty on. Three of those varieties are glyotol Liberty Link varieties from, from Bayer that have true tolerance to glufosinate and glyphosate. And three of those varieties are wide strike varieties from Phytogen that do have a gene that confers tolerance to glufosinate. <laughs> so what you're looking at here is just yield potential. Um, we didn't spray these with Liberty. These again were those same Roundup trials that we had the other six varieties included, but 
What you're looking at is yield potential, and you can see the variety sorted from one to six as far as average lint yield. And then here on the right, you've got some percentages that are, are indicators of consistency. Um, and you can see how they sort out. If you look at the data we've looked at the past few years, 499 has been at the top or close to the top most years. Um, Phytogen 333 this past year looked like it was a pretty good performer as well. Again, you know, in this county trial program, we're only going to look at a certain set of varieties. Um, again, there's other places to look at information. This is just a snapshot of the OVT data. Um, I encourage you to look at it, especially, you know, as we see new varieties released, you know, in the varieties selection uh, section that the seed companies talked, I think there was probably 15 new varieties they talked about for next year. So there's always a lot to choose from. There's a lot of places to look at information, um, and I encourage you to do that if you can. Anybody got any comments or questions on variety selection? Y'all heard enough about varieties today? All right? As far as thinking about cotton and thinking about agronomics, once we make a variety selection decision, what's the next thing to think about? Management, right? Mm -hmm. Are there things we can do to manage a variety differently to get better performance out of it? Are there things we need to worry about? as far as not hurting a particular variety in its performance. For me, from an agronomist standpoint, that's PGRs, right? If you think about PGRs and cotton, the big thing for us was how do we manage cotton when we're not planting 555? And those of you who grew 555 or dealt with that cotton variety, it was a very aggressive variety, one we had to manage extremely intensively, one we had to stay on top of. Basically what we've seen is that most of the new varieties, if not all of them, have less growth potential and ultimately need to be managed a little bit lighter or a little differently um, so that we don't hurt cotton yields. For me, with PGRs, the thing to think about is we've got two things going for us in Georgia. One is we've got an extremely long growing season, right? That's a good thing. The, another thing we've got going for us is we've got some of the poorest fruit retention in the country, right? What does that mean as far as PGRs? For me, ultimately, if I think about PGRs and managing cotton, I'd honestly rather have a bigger plant with more fruit and sites on it than I would trying to limit sites and trying to maybe make that cotton too early and ultimately maybe reduce our yield potential. Does that make sense? It's kind of something we've thought about. As far as PGRs and cotton varieties, um, rather than talk about specific varieties and certain ways to manage certain ones, what I've done is taken data from a trial I've done, I think, five years now, where we basically look at the potential of varieties as far as how big they can get and ultimately how they respond to PGRs, and we basically group them based on their potential or ultimately how we should maybe manage them with PGRs. It's quite a little complicated chart, but ultimately what it does is group varieties based on potential. We've got four you know, arbitrary classifications. The ones at the top are the ones that are going to be the most aggressive in their growth. Ultimately, the ones we need to manage most intensively. Down to the varieties at the bottom here, where I feel like in most cases, if not all, if we've got good fruit retention, we don't need any PGRs at all. Um, so there is some difference as far as how to manage them. Um, you can use this, this chart and kind of think about it when it comes time to plant varieties and think about managing with PGRs. There's an irrigation section, um, and, you know, we've got, I think it's going right now. For me, from an agronomic standpoint with irrigation, we've done a lot of irrigation research in Georgia, right? We've heard about irrigation. We know how important it is as far as making good yields. For me, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of ways to talk about irrigation, and, you know, there's a lot of ways to schedule it. For me, you know, we've got a lot of people who have pivots that don't do anything to schedule irrigation. What I mean by that is how you ask them how they schedule their irrigation, they say, I water when it gets dry. Um, and and if, for me, there's a lot of us that need you know, to make some small steps before we talk about some really detailed ways to schedule irrigation and, and thinking about it from that standpoint. One of the things that we have done over the past few years is tried to think about easy ways to schedule irrigation. And one thing we tried to do was look at a, basically a water use curve from the 70s and, and think about it from the standpoint of if we supply the crop so much water per week and can we maximize yields and basically what we found is this is a pretty good way to do it and basically what we found is if you can give the crop so much water per week whether it's rainfall or irrigation or both 
You can kind of maximize cotton yields. Having said that, it's kind of tricky to do this thing if you get a bunch of rainfall. And ultimately, if you look at it this way, you're going to be putting out a lot of water. So again, there's better ways to do it, but to me, this is an easy way to do it. All you got to have is a rain gauge, right? The next thing to think about ultimately is, is you know, how do you be a better steward of that water? For me, the big thing is how do you schedule irrigation around rainfall? And the question I ask growers in meetings is, if you get two inches of rain during the first week of bloom, how long do you leave the pivot off? Calvin, how do we do that? Is it five days? Is it three days for you down there on the sandy? Is it two days in Camilla? The trick is, if you if you let the crop wilt, you know, our physiologists have proved you can lose two or three hundred pounds of lint. So, you know, the next step is definitely looking at soil moisture, trying to stay on top of it, and you know, I encourage you to think about that as far as, you know, sixty cent cotton, trying to be profitable as far as the irrigation goes. Last thing I'll talk about is is some of the work that I started two years ago, and ultimately I started this for. You know, basically looking at and revisiting some of our rec standard recommendations, but it kind of holds merit if you think about 60 cent cotton, right? What's the first thing we want to do if we want to cut costs in cotton production? Let's spread those seed out, right? Cotton seed's pretty expensive. What I was doing was kind of go back and revisiting some of the recommendations we've got. And what we started to look at was plant populations and seeding rates. What's our, what's our recommendation for seeding rates in cotton in Georgia? It's pretty simple to me. What, two, two and a half seed per foot of row, right? We feel pretty confident in that. What about plant population? I think we feel pretty confident if you get a little more than one plant per foot of row, we can maximize yields, right? We had a lot of data to prove that. We got a lot of experience to do that. Ultimately, what does that mean for us in Georgia? We plant fewer seed than anybody else in the country. And why is that? I think it's that long growing season, that ability to fill up those gaps, and we don't need as high a plant population. The cat trick is, is that research was done in the mid 90s. Doesn't seem like that long ago, but what was that, 15 years ago? If we grew cotton 15 years ago, that's a totally different ball game than last year, right? We've got new varieties that have better yield potential. Um, we can make a lot better yields. So what I did was start to look at, you know, looking at seeding rates and plant populations for high yields, thinking about it from three bale or better cut production. We looked at it two ways. We looked at it from looking at different plant populations, where we planted thick and actually physically went back and thinned to certain plant populations. And we also looked at it from seeding rates. This is just a snapshot of one of those trials. But basically what we saw is that in most cases, if not all, one plant per foot didn't do it. We needed more like one and a half, maybe 1.75 plants per foot of row to maximize yields in these high yield environments, which is a little higher than what we thought in the past. If you look at it from a seeding rate standpoint, what does it take to get that one, one and a half, 1.75 plants per foot of row? And that's the trick for me. You know, if you think about planting cotton, a lot of us say we're going to plant two seed per foot of row, and we start the third week of April and plant until June, right? Don't change it. The trick for me is, is you know, if you go back and look at actually what kind of plant populations we're getting, maybe there's some room to change things and maybe think about, you know, altering that situation. Last thing I'll share as far as seeding rates is one study we did last year that was different than all the rest of them. I think I had seven trials over the past two years, and in every case, if we planted two, two and a half seed per foot of row, we were fine as long as we got good stands and maximizing yields. This past year we had a trial that we looked at seeding rates from one and a half to three seed per foot of row. It was a little different. You know, in this case, we didn't actually maximize yields at two and a half seed per foot of row. We actually maximized yields at three. And it was statistically different, about 120 pounds different. What was different about that trial and all the rest of them was the fact that I planted that cotton on June the 15th. What's planting date got to do with seeding rates? Think about the time you have to make that crop. Ultimately, the later you plant, the less time you have to make those upper and outer fruiting positions. And ultimately, more main stems actually help us improve yields. So again, I wouldn't think we'd change our seeding rates, so to speak, for cotton in Georgia. 
I just think it's something more important to think about, especially for shooting for higher yields. And then ultimately for me, rather than just have a blanket idea on seeding rates, maybe start to think about some things as far as maybe changing them, you know, different situations and that kind of thing. I think that's all I got. Yep. If you're interested, uh, visit our website. I do have some production guides in the truck if y'all are interested in getting some of those. I'm going to try to put them on the door on the way out. I think that's all I got. I will share with you, we had a grad student this morning, um, one of our grad students working with that heavy rye cover crop. And he shared a lot of information and basically what he's been working with, with this heavy rye cover crop. You've heard Stanley Culp ever talk about the benefits as far as weed control, right? What we thought is, you know, this, that system's going to cost us a little money, but ultimately it may, it may have some benefits, of course, as far as weed control, but then what about irrigation and what about soil moisture? If you make that big, heavy rock cover crop, we're talking about eight-foot-tall stuff, ultimately we think it may help us as far as soil moisture, right? So our poor grad student getting a PhD has done work for three years trying to prove that, and ultimately, our idea was we're going to make, have better soil moisture if we've got that heavy rock cover crop. We're going to improve yields. I hadn't been able to do that. Honestly, Kevin, we hurt yields in some, time, some cases, right? He's trying hard, though. He's trying hard. I feel bad for him. So it's three years of work. He's going to try to do it this year. I'm like, man, I'll try it again. For me, that means two things. One, if you do irrigation research, it rains, right? It always does that. But I think what we've seen is that Cotton is very, can compensate very well as far as, you know, yields go. And honestly, it just shows how hard it is to change things, and that's one good thing about cotton in Georgia. If you see a yield difference in a trial, I get excited because it's really hard to get one because co cotton can compensate so well. Um, so if you're interested, you know, I've got some of those slides. Well, I think they'll be on the website. You know, we do create an environment where we have better soil moisture with those heavy rye cover crops and then I think if we ever have an average normal year as far as rainfall we may see some differences as far as yield goes. So that's all I got guys. Are there any questions or comments?